Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer, where we talk about music and the methods for making music with top performers in the music industry. I'm your host, Dan. This week's featured guest is Crystal McGrath. Now, Crystal is a musician, activist, podcast host, and inter inspirational, I almost said international influencer, also an international influencer, and also an inspirational influencer. Crystal has toured the US, Canada, Mexico, and the UK, and Australia, supporting, supporting Canadian country legends such as George Canyon and Aaron Pritchett. Her latest release, well, that's actually not her latest release, but her last release, Game On, before the one we're about to talk about, produced by Spencer Cheyenne, was released on radio in September 2020 and went on to Sirius XM CBC Country Top 40 and was added in rotation uh, on Australia Commercial Country Radio Networks and the video was added to Australian MTV and CMT Network Rotation. Crystal has a passion for connecting with people and creating an outlet let for their stories to be shared. This is evident through her podcast, Crushing Chaos. Check it out, folks, where she interviews women pushing through the resistance in their personal and professional lives. You can also see her hosting her video podcast. Check it out, folks. The artists behind the music. Her latest pop country single, About a Boy, is out now wherever you get your music. And you can find Crystal on Instagram and Twitter at Crystal McGrath, that's C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-M-C-G-R-A-T-H, and Facebook at Crystal McGrath Music. Crystal, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Quick question to get us started. What's a piece of music you've heard in the past couple days or weeks that really stood out to you? Ooh, in the recent days. That's a good question. I feel like I've been listening to a lot of deep house music lately. When I'm working, I just throw on deep house playlists like random ones on youtube or spotify <laughs> i just i don't even know what's playing and they just keep me focused there's something about that that beat that just keeps me keeps me in the zone so i honestly that's really all i've been listening to <laughs> have you ever checked out like a uh, south african house no so it's 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 sort of like Deep House is sort of related to it as in the, in the way that like the chords and everything are really sort of toned back and it's all about that interaction of the bass and cool. the drums and everything. You might like it. South African I'll check it out. South African House. Okay, um, writing it down. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, is there something about the house music it's just, just the fact that it's like that vibe that you can sort of put it on and groove with it? Yeah, there's just something because there's usually words that are kind of floating within the song, yes. but I feel like it's not really lyric story focused. So I don't find myself caught in, oh, what are they talking about? What am I supposed to be feeling? Or, you know, what's I find when I'm listening to music, I'm often thinking, oh, cool. I like what they did vocally or because just being a vocal coach and a musician and a writer, I'm just always paying attention to those small little nuances in music. And I find when I'm listening to house music, it's just this consistent beat that I can just feel and that feeling for me brings out focus and I love that when I'm working is just to okay I gotta get this done I'm not thinking about what's going on around me it's just like driving my focus <laughs> have you ever tried going to a house club you know what um I in the past I have not recent but um I remember when I toured Australia they had so many cool house music clubs that that we checked out and that's I think that's really where my love for house music started way way back then and and it's funny because I don't really know much about like I couldn't say I love this artist and this artist and this artist um but now that we're having this conversation I'm, I'm inspired to do a little more research on on who these artists are that I love listening to so much <laughs> And when you were going out to these uh, clubs, when you were touring Australia, were you seeing like there's a very particular style of dancing for house music? Now, did did you see did you see the house music dancing? Yes, absolutely. There was definitely uh, a freedom, yes. a freedom dancing. Yes. I'm going to call that freedom yeah. dancing and liquid movements. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I remember somebody taught me this thing to to do this little wave dance with your fingers <laughs> it's a whole it man it's this whole subculture and like there's this whole yeah. thing around there's this mindset and this lifestyle that goes along with house music it's it's wild it's like they're all about like positivity and love and life and just having a good time and making good music and like right. it's good wild vibes. it's good vibes and 
it's funny because like that's not my style of music to perform or sing or you know I'm like a yogi country singer <laughs> so, <laughs> but hey you know what we can uh, have variety variety is important <laughs> variety is so important so speaking of variety you know you've toured internationally you've been around uh singing in uh uk australia canada how do you maintain your vocal health while you're on the road because you know there's dehydration being on planes sleep schedules messed up and for anyone out there who's ever tried singers thinking about singing listen if your sleep schedule messed up it gets messed up one of the first things to go is that sort of relaxed nice thing that we're looking for from the voice so could you maybe talk a little bit about that absolutely um, vocal care is number one. So hydration is so important. Make sure you're drinking tons of water. And especially when you're flying, you need to amp that water intake up because dehydration is what comes with, you know, traveling and different altitudes and pressures and all those crazy things from all the different places in the world. But water hydration, I would say is the most important thing. Sleep is so important too. And, you know, I know, the musician lifestyle, like typically people think late night shows, lots of drinking, partying, all that kind of stuff. For me, I'm usually the first one out of the bar. If we're playing in a bar, I'm like the first one out. <laughs> and, you know, after you kind of engage with people, but you don't need to be the last person doing shots at the bar to, especially when you have shows back to back to back. I mean, it's more important that t you take care of yourself so that you can perform the next day instead of, you know, partying at the bar with, with everyone till the end of the night because alcohol definitely dries out your your vocal cords and I'm not against drinking I'm not saying don't have anything to drink it's just more so make sure moderation you're taking care of your, your health and yourself and it's really easy to burn out on the road and when you're constantly going from one thing to the next thing and always having to be on that's that's an exhausting thing in itself so really making sure you know, you're balancing that out with time out for yourself. So, you know, if you're in a hotel, make sure you, you know, take a few hours and, and just sit and rest and watch TV without feeling guilty or meditate or do yoga or do the things that fill your cup up every single day. Because if you're not doing that, then your burnout starts to climb up really, really quickly. And then food, nutrition, make sure you're eating healthy, eating for fuel, not just for survival. I think, you know, it's really easy to be like driving around and, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, there's like a fast food place. Let's get some, the quickest thing we can. Um, make sure you have snacks that are healthy and that you can, you know, sustain your energy. That's, that's a really important thing. And it's just too easy to eat unhealthy in this culture and society now that, you really have to put the focus and energy into, okay, how am I going to plan for success today? And I think that's a really important tool to, to touch on is at the start of your day, how am I going to plan to have the most successful day that I can? And it doesn't have to be mountains. It's little things like, you know, make sure my water bottle's full, make sure I have a few snacks just in case I'm, you know, super hungry and don't want to cave and eat you know, a burger and fries, because that's going to make me tired. Um, make sure I schedule enough sleep, w have a sleep mask. That's another great little um, tool that I love is just, you know, put a mask on your eyes so that you can tune out the world because sometimes you have to sleep in bright hours just to make sure you're getting those, those sleep hours in. Those are a few tips, I would say. So outside of the lifestyle because all these are things that also i i do want to touch on one thing you said before i get to my next question which is yeah. that you talked about how in our culture it's so easy to get because when you're driving on a highway it's like every exit you see those golden arches you see there's always options there to go eat something that's not going to be healthy for you and that's just going to fill you up in the moment and the other countries you're touring you're touring canada you're touring the uk you're touring australia it's the same thing mm -hmm. it, and so going through that extra step and it like you said it's a lot of work but to actually bring squirrel food with you you know to actually have like the cashews and the yeah. almonds and everything like 
in the luggage. You know, of course, understand when you go to different countries, the customs rules. But the po point is that that extra step, while it can feel like a lot at first, the investment of the energy and the time doing that pays off dividends that, uh, I mean, it's it's insane the difference it can make when you're traveling. Of, yeah, absolutely. And then once it's a routine, it becomes less work, right? It's just like anything. It's just, yeah, this is just part of my part of my day. And And once you realize, you know, it's not an extra step, it's just a part of living healthy, then it takes the the work out of it I guess mm. as well. so in addition to the lifestyle things like eating and sleeping right and staying hydrated mm -hmm. do you have any other little tricks that you like to do when you're on the road to help keep that voice ready to go or to get that voice ready to go or if you're feeling starting to feel a little burnout how are you going to recover from that and spin yourself out of it yes so vocal warm-ups really important I love using the straw method in the water, so blowing bubbles in water through a tiny straw is something that's a really quick fix. Um, we're just re-energizing your vocal cords or a muscle, right? So it's just like exercising. We have to make sure we're exercising our vocal cords, um, cooling down, warming up, all those little things. Um, a nebulizer, so steaming, that's something that's really helpful too. So I have one that is portable and I can bring it with me where I go. Um, so when I'm starting to feel tired or especially after being on a plane and that dehydration, um, you want to just rehydrate your vocal cords. So using a steamer is a really, really helpful thing. And you can, you can grab those things, um, at the drugstore or online, anywhere. They're a very handy tool for a singer. So you actually started during quarantine, a business called simply socials management, which I had yes. no idea until I started reading through your bio and doing a little research. This is actually how we got connected as someone from your team reached out and this is how we got to here on the podcast. So can you talk a little bit about how you balance being a musician, but also a entrepreneur who has her fingers in many different pots <laughs> and why you wanted to start a new business. I mean, was it because you had extra time, you weren't on tour, touring schedules got pushed back? What was the impetus? Yeah, it's a great question. I love doing a lot of things. And I think when you do what you love, it feels a little less like work and just more like you're filling your cup up. Mm. And I've always had a passion for digital marketing, marketing in general, public relations, connection with people and inspiring people to be the best version of themselves is my personal mission statement. And that kind of falls within every category that I, I do work in. Uh, but Simply Socials Management, I run that with my partner, Darren. And a few years ago, we were kind of talking about the idea of putting together this um, marketing agency because everything that I do in all my businesses all revolves around marketing. And I had built a really great team of people to assist me with you know, my social media, my marketing, my graphics, design, PR, all of those good things. So building all of that over, you know, so many years and living and working the experience. Um, it's one thing to go to school and learn, learn these skills, which I did initially. Um, but to apply them into the real world, into, into business and to see results from the actions was, is very inspiring. And, you know, we thought, cool, this would be awesome if we could take, you know, all of these things that we've learned and, help other people do the same thing. So it's a huge passion to be able to create opportunity for people and to help people see the potential within themselves. And I love the team members that, that we have on our on our team at Simply Socials are all so amazing. And it's, it's really rewarding for me to be able to provide them with opportunities to do what they do best um, on multiple facets. So yeah, it's uh, I don't think it was an extra amount of time that we had. It was just more of something we've wanted to do for, for quite some time. And we were given this opportunity um, during quarantine times, COVID times, um, to really reach out to a lot more people and to, to see how important digital marketing is in this day and age and how that's not going to go away um, moving forward. I think, you know, 
And we can see from the past year and a half how everybody's life has shifted to this online educational world, business world, communication world. Everything is is online and it's international and it's so easy to connect with people in different countries now where, you know, before we still had this technology, but we didn't really have the awareness that, oh, we don't have to hop on a plane to have a meeting in Zurich. We can just hop on Zoom and or whatever your platform is. And I think that's just really, really awakening that the opportunity is there for growth and it's not going to go away. And so to build foundations um, that we can continue to grow and elevate on, I think is is really empowering and very exciting to me to to know that there is just so much growth and potential out there. So who's the ideal customer for Simply Social's management? Yeah, we have a few different outlets. So uh, music is is one that's huge and important to me because we live and breathe music here. And then film and TV, we have um, a division for that. And then we work with a lot of small businesses, coaches, event planners, um, and really, it's just open to to anybody who needs assistance with social media marketing. It's all the same across the board. It's just developing different strategies for different different areas. And um, amongst our team, we have people that focus in different different subdivisions that are their passion. So I think it's just really important that people are working in their passion and and working on areas that that they love and that light them up because work shouldn't be a drag work should be exciting work should be fun and um i really support that in our work culture is you know love what you do so speaking of love what you do and stuff that lights you up as you mentioned one of your passions is empowering others and helping others so i'm actually curious because this is uh the description of your podcast i'm wondering what kind of resistance are you pushing through in your career and life right now what what's crystal working on right now great question it's uh always something right we're always working on something and it's funny someone's i used to say we're like an onion and you know we peel back the layers i say that all the time yeah and then i just had somebody say to me you know it's more like um an artichoke with the heart in the center and we're peeling back those later i was like oh i like that it's just more heart center and less like eye stinging. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so for me right now, I think I'm just constantly working on the internal, listening to my internal voices. And I've been doing a ton of meditation. So I'm actually right now on this day 18 of this um, meditation challenge that is 21 days. So I'm almost there. And it's funny because I talk about meditating and I preach meditation and I don't always take the time to do the things that I am constantly, you know, putting out into the world to do. And so I've really taken this, you know, the past couple months to dive deeper within. I think throughout the past, you know, 16 months, it's been a lot of internal reflection. And I, you know, I have lots of conversations about this, how prior to the pandemic, we were very external focused. We were very go, go, go. What is this person thinking you know, what are the expectations of me? How am I living up to what society expects me to be? And this past year and a half has just really kind of made us tune out those external voices and tune into our own internal selves and personal development and growth. And it's something that we're always on this journey of. But for me, I feel like this past year and a half, and especially right now, I feel like I'm kind of coming through the breakthrough of all the work I've done of, you know, listen to what does crystal need what does crystal want what lights what lights me up and how can i bring more energy into listening to my own truth and my own direction that i want to go in instead of thinking you know oh what do they want to hear or what do you, what do they want to see or what should i be putting out for the other people as opposed to what do i want to hear what do i want to see what do what lights me up you know And so I find it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing because it's something that I've always believed in and always talked about, but to fully step into that power of listening to the internal self is is quite empowering and it's not easy. And I think when you look deep within, I think that can bring up a lot of, a lot of old insecurities and old beliefs that maybe you haven't looked at or dealt with. And so it's kind of a fun 
scary, exciting process when you dive deep and do the work on, you know, overcoming your own fears and obstacles. And doing this meditation challenge has really helped kind of overcome and, and dive deeper and, and just open up to, you know, different feelings or thoughts that you didn't even know, know were there. So it's always a, a growth journey every day. <laughs> so what is the meditation challenge? Yeah, so it's um, Deepak Chopra and Alicia Keys do this 21-day huh. um, diving into, like, the feminine power. So, you know, it's interesting. And it's for men and women, but we all are yin and yang based. And I find for me, a lot of my life I'm spent in the yang zone, working and going and, you know, not really slowing down. And even though we've just gone through this pandemic where, you know, touring hasn't been busy, but I've still been you know, every single day has been full on. So, and I find it's even harder to take a break when I'm constantly at home because everything I need to do is home, is at home. And so it's just really easy to get lost in the world of the computer and the to-do list and the task list and to step away and take a break, I find very challenging. So doing this um, meditation, just really focused on the yin self, the internal voices, the expression of the self, the nurturing, the self-care, all of those good things. Um, yeah, it's a really, I highly recommend you check it out. And uh, yeah, good So times. with this process of trying to balance the yin and the yang, I think most mm -hmm. anyone out there who has a passion for something, and especially musicians, um, can really relate to this quandary if you will of there's only so much time in the day you only have so much energy and when you get the ball rolling on something sometimes it's really hard to step away mm. from what's happening and especially for folks who um I, i'll speak for myself are uh, type a um, perhaps maybe we could apply this label to you as well. Um, even though the type A, type B, whatever, well, I understand the fallibility in that, but you, you understand what I'm saying? Go getter, ready to rumble, always doing something. There's a joy and a good feeling in being busy and finding that time where you're not doing something to actually create a more effective work time. I think is a huge, huge thing. Like what you're talking about, meditation, taking 15, 20 minutes before the day to meditate will increase productivity and how effective you're going to be. So could you maybe talk a little bit about how you've seen this 21 day, well, 18 day so far challenge have impacts on your performance and on your outlook and on the balance? Yeah, it's just really important when you take that time at the beginning of the day. And I always try to do this in the morning so that I, it's done and I don't have to feel guilty about skipping it or, you know, worrying about when am I going to fit it in in the day. So I highly recommend doing these things at the start of your day. So maybe that means getting up a half an hour early. That's, you know, just a fraction of your day. So try it and it, you'd be surprised. It, it just becomes a routine. Um, but starting your day in that mindset of, you know, working through any blocks or obstacles or, or allowing any emotions that are trapped inside of you that could hold you back from being the best version of you that day, allowing them to surface and releasing them through breath, through mindset, through you have to cry it out, cry it out, you know, just releasing whatever comes out for you is so important just so that you can start your day with a clear mind and a clear focused vision on okay, what is it that I need to do? I find, you know, being so full all the time, it can be very distracting on what does the to-do list look like? What do I need to get done today? And when you take that time to meditate and, you know, put yourself in a, in a quiet space where you can clear your mind and go through your own mental blocks, it allows you to see your, your list a little clearer. It allows you to communicate better. It allows you to just see a little bit more light in the day. So meditation for busy minds, I would say, is the best thing that you can do for yourself just to create that small fraction of balance. I mean, you know, if you're busy 16 hours of the day, 20 minutes is a small, small fraction that does wonders and benefits. Can you talk just 
to change uh, tracks here a little bit, can you talk yeah. a little bit about the frequency with which you've been releasing music? Is there any strategy that you're employing trying to release around certain times of year or depending on the content of the song? Are you writing songs for certain times of year or is it just like you're getting a song together when everything's together, you're releasing it? I think there's definitely seasons for different styles of different styles, different feelings of music. I don't necessarily write for a season. Like I won't plan, okay, well, January, I want to release, you know, kind of an inspirational feel good started a year song. So I'm going to write this song in, you know, the March prior and record it in the summer. And then I don't typically plan that far in, in regards to what kind of song. So Basically, I will write a ton of songs, and then when it feels good to release that, I kind of be like, yeah, this feels like this season of the song, if you will. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think September for me, I love releasing music in September. It's like my new year. I, it's always felt for me like January 1st is September. I love September. It's just, it's fall, and it's just fresh, and new new things are starting, and even though it's like almost the end of the year, it just feels like a revival. So I found I've released most of my new singles and EPs in September, just as a kind of track record. <laughs> so are um, we are we on track for a September release this year, Crystal? We are on track for a September release. So we have new music coming out in September. So oh, exciting. <laughs> what can you tell us about the project? Well, I will um, I will let you just let it unroll because oh. I'm not sure which one it's going to be yet. <laughs> oh, exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a couple that uh, we just finished recording our EP, so, or my EP, and uh, I say our because it's not just me that's involved. It's a whole team of people beside me and that helped create this magic, so our EP <laughs> um, will be coming out. Um, early 2022 so we're going to be releasing one of those songs in September we're just trying to figure out what the feeling is just like what you just mentioned you know what's the right frequency for September and I'll know I'll know probably within a week what that's going to look like and uh, yeah it's very very exciting to be putting new stuff out and it's cool that to record an EP because I think right now a lot of a lot of the world is let's release a single 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 so to have a collection of songs that I can choose from kind of changes the waters a little bit for me to to actually have different different options to to choose from speaking of teamwork something that you do incredibly well across your social media when you release music is you acknowledge everyone on the team who's contributed to the song and helped make it possible can you talk a little bit about that philosophy and how basically you are running your show. Teamwork is so important. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, you can't do everything by yourself. And I, for so many years, I really thought, oh, I got this. I can do this and I can do this. And I can, you know, even though I can do all the things, it's um, I can't do all the things because I'm one human and I don't have time to do all the things. And not everything is in my zone of genius. And I think it's really important, you know, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, for people to be positioned in the areas that they, you know, soar in and that they love to do. So really just bringing people on board that, you know, shine in certain areas and can do those sections to the best of their capabilities and which in turn assists the project, assists me in, in being the best version of me. So Having a strong team is really, really important. And I would say just like as an advice point for new artists, I think sometimes being a new artist, you think, oh, I need to have this and I need this and this and this. You know, I need a team of 10 people to be successful. Could you maybe give examples of the roles those 10 people would play? Yeah, absolutely. So publicity, that's important. Producer, super important. So a producer you'd want to have, that would be kind of your key player on your early team if you're a new artist you want to have a producer songwriters collaborators different people to write with um, there's something to be said about writing with different people it's it's really easy to think oh this is my project and I want it to be my words and I want this to all be like my feeling and my emotions I find a lot of um, creatives can be like that just I want this to be a reflection of me but there's 
it's so cool when you do collaborate with other people, it can still be a reflection of you and your words and story. But when you bring in other ideas and concepts, it just can help elevate and your ideas and your feelings to, to a broader level that more people can connect with. Um, so, especially if you're writing for, um, commercially, like if you want your songs to go to radio, things like that, that makes a huge difference. What were you... So singer starting out, artist starting out thinks they need all of these people and ultimately they do, yeah. but starting out. Yeah. Starting out producer writers, writing team. That's important. Um, if you have budget for publicists, that's, that's a good thing good role to have at the beginning um huh to help and is there a company story. called uh, simply socials management that can help artists out <laughs> who, who need publicity when they're first starting out yes there is there oh, absolutely cool. is yeah yeah they, i've heard of them somewhere <laughs> um building your bio so you know the publicity team doesn't have to be just out there finding you press they can also be helping you build your story so building your story is a huge part um, media training, understanding how to communicate your story to the public. What pieces do you want to share? What areas do you want to elevate? Those are really great tools to build at the start. Um, the bio, your one sheet, all of those pieces are really important to, to have for, for the branding as aspect. And then once you start, you know, getting your live show together, you start getting, you know, looking into getting a booking agent and then you look into, you know, am I going to release this song to radio? And how am I going to do that? I'm going to need a radio tracker, someone to help support that song. That's a whole job in itself is promotions to radio. And, you know, people kind of think, oh, they just put their song out and the radio picks it up. But no, it's a full-time job for somebody to be out there pushing your song because there's so many songs out there. And, and so you do, you do need that person to, to be your cheerleader in the radio world um and nowadays we have streaming so having a playlist promotions company um on board to help push your single to to streaming that's a whole new area that we've just recently um kind of dove into over the past few years is is the streaming world and there's a massive market for for that as well and that's really how, you know, people are measuring success is, you know, where's my audience? You can see all the analytics, which is so cool. Like, where are people listening to my music? And that in turn can help you decide, oh, where shall I tour next? Well, cool. People in Australia are streaming my song on Spotify a ton. So maybe I should go see the fans there. And it can really help you, you know, taking that information with your hashtags on social media. Like, who do I want to drive these posts to? Who's listening to my music? So using all these kind of areas, and that's where digital marketing agencies can come in handy to bring on board your team to help you understand those analytics and help you understand where should I be putting my energy into. And then management, that's a great um, key player as well. But having a manager at the beginning doesn't really make sense to me if you don't have anything to manage. So really making sure you understand your brand and your vision and the pieces of who you are as an artist before bringing on a manager, I think is really important so that you don't get kind of diluted in somebody else's thoughts on who you should be or, you know, what direction you should go in. And when you really know your business and understand your brand, that's when you bring these people on so that they can help lift the machine and keep it rolling. Um, but you can't bring all these people on if you have no idea, you know, what it is that you want and where you want to take your business in your direction and what success means to you. So really figuring out all those pieces is so important before, you know, bringing on a whole bunch of team members. I think the one exception I would say to everything you just said was if you have a manager who has the connections to all the people you just mentioned, a manager who has connections oh, yes. to producer, radio, producer, in that case, you want to have them in earlier. But to balance that out, there's that dichotomy. Like you said, once you're bringing another, especially a manager, that, that sort of manager-client relationship can really turn into, if it's right, can really turn into this um, symbiotic relationship where at what everyone is doing is helping everyone else. But like you also said, it can also turn into a manager having ideas artistically where you're going to go and those come out 
um, and can or cannot be good things for the artist to do. So perhaps we could talk about your recommendations for artists or people who are thinking about becoming artists in terms of that first step, defining themselves, like reading a book, like start with why, like reading business books for artists can the value cannot be understated because it's music business. It's you, the amount of time you're going to spend writing, creating, tracking the song sometimes pales into in comparison to the amount of time and effort and budget needed on the business end to actually get that song in front of people. So what are your best practices or best um, advice for people who are starting out um, to try and define their brand, their art, and themselves? Yeah. So you're right. It is a business. It's not just creating music and, you know, hopping on stage and singing. There's a huge machine um, behind it. So really, I would say brainstorm. You know, I'm a big fan of mood boards and vision boards and and all of those good things. But I remember pre-internet world, I would cut things out of magazines and I would have binders from years ago of just, you know, what do I want the style to look like? What do I want the sound to look like? And I would just, you know, fill these binders up with collages of ideas on what inspired me as a musician and what I wanted to, you know, share with the world. And now we can use things like Pinterest. So you can make boards go through different, you know, stylistically, what kind of music do I like? Let's, you know, put those on a board. What kind of colors do I like? Let's put those on a board. What do those colors represent? Um, You know, for instance, for me, pink. I love the color pink, just generally speaking, and I love sparkles. But pink is also a feminine color, and it's a branch of red, and red is a power color. So pink is like a representation of feminine power. And I love that mindset. And when I see pink, I feel that empowerment. So finding, you know, the colors and the brand and the what is it, for you that lights you up and that inspires you from the color scheme because right now social media that's where you're putting all of your posts so if you can find a way to incorporate some cool branding using your your colors and really creating that oh cool I know that that girl they really like the color blue everything you know has and so now when people see blue they think of that artist right um so it's just the association of things like that so mood boarding, all of these different areas. I could go on for hours and days about that. Um, but that's a really great kind of artistic way to, to start. Marketing plan. So there's tons of tools, resources. Go on Google, type in how to make a marketing plan, and you're going to see a ton of different examples come up, questions. Start a Word document and start answering those questions. You know, what is your mission statement? What are your values? What are three words that represent you as an artist, as a brand? Who's your target market? What do they look like? Where are they shopping? Where are they hanging out? How old are they? What country are they in? You know, go into detail. Those are just a few of many, many different questions on a marketing plan. But you want to have a foundation of a general idea of those answers because those are the kind of things that are going to help drive your business decisions and help drive, you know, what direction you want to go in. And, you know, just to kind of touch back on that manager aspect, absolutely have one from the start. There's nothing wrong with that. I just want to clarify that there's nothing wrong with having a manager from day one. I actually did um, from the start and it did help with the different connections. But I also found that you can get just, you know, lost in what is my, what is my vision? What is it that I need? And that's just my story. Everyone has a, a different experience and story. But you doing things like mark, creating your own marketing plan just so you know what it is that you want. And then when you bring other people on board, they can add to it. They can shift it. They can change it. But as long as it kind of starts with your ideas is, is very, very helpful. Um, doing research on different ways to make money, royalties, like know where do you make your money from as a musician There are so many different streams of revenue that, you know, are so untouched by a lot of people. If you play a live show, um, you know, as a Canadian through SoCan, you can send them your set list and you can generate revenue through that. 
You can generate revenue through, you know, your royalties on sound exchange, on resound, um, your neighboring rights royalties, your mechanical royalties, your songwriting royalties, your performance royalties. And these are all a lot of things that I didn't know until later into my into my career. So do your research on, you know, what are the different ways that you can make money doing music? Because it's not just about selling albums or performing. There's a lot of other opportunities that you can that you can dive into. Um, join different Facebook groups as a really free, easy, simple resource on the music business. You know, if you t- go on Facebook and type in music business under groups, you're going to see tons of groups with people in there talking and supporting each other and support your community. It's just there's something really magical about helping other people and asking questions and not being afraid to ask a dumb question. I think for me, you know, a lot of, a lot of my time I was like, oh, I don't want to ask that because, you know, maybe that makes me look stupid. So I'm just not going to ask and I'm not going to know. And then what's more dumb than not knowing, (laughs) you know, it's just ask the question. Like it's, there's nothing wrong with asking. Reach out to people. People want to help you. They really, they really do. So don't be afraid to ask send someone a message on Instagram, on Facebook, on email, you know, ask, ask questions and get to know people. And I I think that's a really, really helpful thing when you're just starting out is to, to get into that networking and, and we can do that online now. We don't have to go to conferences and things like that to, to do that. Things like Clubhouse are great for connecting with the music industry. I mean, you can go into groups with some of the best producers, management, um, label team members just in clubhouse, just all on there having a conversation and they'll do, you know, feature Friday and have people come in and play a snippet of their song and give you feedback. So there's just a lot of really cool new ways to get out there and, and market. And yeah, those are a few new tips. <laughs> the one thing I would add from the business side is two yes. books start with why and Vern Harnish's Scaling Up. Ah. I think reading both of those, if you go through all the processes and all the work that is asked of you in those two books, you will come out the other end as an artist being so much clearer on who you are, what you're about, what your mission is, why you're doing what you're doing. And then if that is the core, you can then bring that core understanding to anyone crystal listed, including uh, designers for making fonts and logos and color schemes, all that stuff. Because Crystal, what you were describing, making those mood boards, that's also you clearly have an eye for the visual part of making Mm -hmm. a brand. Not everyone has that, Mm -hmm. um, that spark, if you will. So for some yeah. people, it might be a question of taking that mission statement, that understanding of the artist and going to a designer and working with a design team to create a color totally. palette, to create branding, to create all that stuff. So yeah, that that's a great summary. And I think uh, the one, one last thing I want to add is in uh, America, we have BMI and ASCAP are yes. the PROs, yes. uh, which are performance rights organizations. Right. Right. Uh, Crystal, what is the threshold of sleep that you need to feel no impact on your performance the next day vocally? Seven hours is my secret number right now. I've played around with this a lot. It's If I get more than that, I'm, t- way, I'm too tired. If I sleep more than nine hours, I'm just not in a good, I'm groggy and I just don't have that same pep. If I sleep five hours I'm tired so and then I need like caffeine to keep going I don't like being dependent on caffeinated (laughs) things so I yeah seven hours is my is my secret number and we already talked about meditation and mindfulness but how do you find that it impacts your performance specifically Mm -hmm. focus so when you're on stage it can be very distracting so I find sometimes I'll be singing and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about my grocery list or, you know, something else that happened or something that I'm going to do tomorrow. But I'm still like performing and dancing and singing the words to the song. And and there's something about that meditative practice that allows me to stay, come back 
to center. So if you've ever meditated, what happens is your mind is like, oh, what's this over here? Oh, what's this over here? But then you come back to the quiet and then you go, oh, what's this over here? With You know, I just find my mind is always, always going. But through that process, you let it go and then you come back to center and then, you know, it just kind of continues until you find this space of stillness. And that I find is very helpful practice to apply on stage when my mind is thinking about this and then thinking about this. I find I'm, I'm able to come back to center a lot more quickly and a lot more presently. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, I'm performing. Okay, let's like get back into the zone and stay in that stillness of performing. So that's a small little tool I find that it just really helps with that commitment to being present. And that can be a huge challenge. Do you exercise? And if so, how do you find that exercise impacts performance and creativity? Absolutely. I exercise. So I have a fitness company called Live With Love. And <laughs> I do yeah, all sorts of fun things in the bag of tricks. <laughs> we're we're going to play it. We're going to play a game like, you know, when you go to like the carnival and there's a bunch of jelly beans in a thing and whoever guesses the closest number of jelly beans like wins a thousand dollars. We're going to have a game called Guess How Many Companies Crystal <laughs> McGrath is running right now. And whoever gets the closest is going to get something. <laughs> send you a shirt (laughs) there you go (laughs) I love that um but yeah so I do um spin and yoga bar meditation sound bowl healing um hit classes personal training nutritional health coaching and all within this platform and it's a virtual platform so we do daily fitness classes as well as there's an on-demand video library of hundreds of classes so For me, fitness exercise is so important. So my three things in life are movement, mindset, well, I guess four, movement, mindset, music, and marketing. Those are my four M's. (laughs) And yeah, so movement performance is very hand in hand related. You need to have the stamina to jump on stage and, you know, move on stage and sing for X amount of hours without feeling tired. So that cardiovascular endurance, the muscle strength, it all goes hand in hand. And yes, so fitness is very important for being a performer. And that is really what inspired me to to get into fitness actually was because I was going to bar classes every day and I was thinking, well, this is this is crazy. Like I'm I'm coming and I'm watching somebody else, you know, perform and it's very expensive. So how can I you know, what can I do to, to shift this? And I thought, oh, I can teach. And then I would be getting paid to exercise and to be on a microphone and to be running around a room, practicing my stage performance every day and be doing the same fitness class that I was doing before. So I'm all about how do I maximize my time? (laughs) So I was now incorporating, I started teacher training And that's really what got me into teaching fitness was so that I could use it as a tool to enhance my stage performance. So I I have had an experience with sound bowl healing. Yeah, I know. I know. You just talked for like five minutes. And my one takeaway is you said sound bowl healing. (laughs) But okay, hear me out. And everyone out there who is like me, incredibly skeptical. And as soon as someone says someone says sound bowl healing, they're rolling their eyes. All right. Listen, this one time I had a terrible flu. I was feeling so bad. I laid down in this room. This lady played her bowls. And 45 minutes later, I'm telling you, I felt 80% better. Like, okay, yes, we can say, all right, well, you were lying down for 45 minutes. So you probably felt better because you rested. But I'm telling you, something was going on there. And I there's no scientific papers you can go find that'll break it down. But Crystal, could you maybe talk a little bit about your experience with sound bowl healing and mm. why that's a thing. It's amazing. And yes, I understand that, you know, people can look at it and be like, uh, what are you talking about? You're telling me like that sound is going to make me feel better. I don't know, girl, you're crazy. That's cool. Like you do you. But for me, I was in Banff and we went into the sound bowl store and this lady started playing the bowls in the store. And I just felt like we came out of the store and my body was buzzing. Like I felt huh. like there was fuzz all over like happy fuzz like it just happy fuzz happy fuzz okay <laughs> whatever that feels like it just it was this just vibrational feeling that you don't get from anything else in the world like 
it just ignited something in me that was free and loving and just safe feeling. Um, so basically sound bowls, they come in all different notes. So it's very related to music, which I love. Um, but sounds, music heals. We all say that. I don't think I've met anyone that, that doesn't feel that music on some level makes them feel something and makes them help, help them move through something. We all have a song that we've heard that has helped us move through an emotion or an experience in our lives. And, and to interject on that, Crystal, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but just to no, back that okay. up, that, that has been proved scientifically. They've done mm -hmm. studies in hospitals playing music for people. Recovery time goes down. This stuff is scientifically proven. Absolutely. Yeah. And so sound bowls, it's a, just a branch of that. It's, a, it's music. It's connecting to tonal vibrations and frequencies. So when you play, so I have seven sound bowls and each sound bowl is related to a different energetic chakra. And basically we have seven chakras and, and this is, you know, I could talk about this for hours too on a whole separate show, <laughs> but, but basically each bowl relates to a different emotion or a different feeling and a different vibration. And so this can be mentally, this can be physically, a lot of times, you know, our physical ailments can be a reflection of our emotional well-being. So when we heal the emotion, when we heal the heart, when we start to heal our, our physical space. Um, for me, I suffer with heartburn all the time. I get heartburn. And when I sit and play a sound bowl um, related to fear, related to anxiety, all of a sudden the heartburn just goes away. So it's kind of like what you said about your not feeling well and coming out of that space, just feeling more centered and, and grounded. There's just so I could go on forever about this, <laughs> but in summary, there's something about the frequency of the sound connecting to allowing a release in our physical and emotional state to be set free so that we can heal our body from the inside out. And that's, a very quick synopsis of it I don't know if we need to know why like it just kind of just kind of does it and sometimes things are just left that are unknown and just accepting the fact that it makes you feel good so if you want to try it out I have a free two-week membership on my site and hey, I have, all right yeah I have tons of uh sound bowl videos up there and I do a free sound bowl class on Sundays so you're welcome to come check it out Live cool <laughs> um, I am one of those people who does need to know, by the way, <laughs> I, I absolutely not, not, um, I'm not trying to take us there, but like the, my, my point is just that like we, we, they've done, okay, look, it's a question of money, right? Because they have the money to go in and like play Mozart to people and be like, okay, yeah, th this increases healing time. I'm not sure who has a couple million dollars to do a sound bowl study. <laughs> I'm just saying there's no like sound bowl like consortium there, there's no like the sound bowl lobby who's yeah. like try, try, trying to get this this stuff passed like that that's part of the problem too it's that we can't mm -hmm. the, the money's not there to study it so totally. I, I think I think for the for the skeptics out there maybe we just need to start a sound bowl fund and then we can all just go. like we, 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 yeah see there you go See, I'm a feeling girl. I'm like, if it feels ah, good, let's roll with it. Yes. I don't need to know anything more. I'm just like, that's good. Let's let's do it. If it feels good. Let's go with it. So where can people catch this uh, Sunday class? Now, for the Sunday class, are you teaching yeah. people how, like, the technique of making the bowls? Or are you doing the bowls and then people can experience the exactly. benefit from it? So I do the bowls and then people can experience. So it's all done through Zoom. Um, livewithlove.ca is the website that you can go to and you can see all the different classes and can listen to videos and kind of get your own little experience. I also have a seven day sound bowl, um, freebie on my website as well. So there's seven different videos and worksheets that go along with the, with the chakras. So you can kind of learn a little bit more about, you know, why is this bowl reflected to this emotion or this feeling or this body part and how they kind of work together through your own personal journaling and, and experience through it. That's super interesting. And for anyone who wants to try that out, the link 
if you're on YouTube, it's in the description below. And if you're on audio, it is in the show notes. Crystal, do you define yourself as a musician, a human who makes music, or something else? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I have never really thought about that. A human that makes music. That's interesting. A musician. I feel like I'm a vessel for for experience or a vessel for music and emotion and and inspiration. An inspirational vessel. That's how huh. I would explain. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, with practice, specifically music practice now, do you have a time or times of day that you prefer to practice? It varies. I do like practicing at night. I find in the daytime, especially lately, um, I think daytime hours are very work focused on the computer and just, you know, sending out emails and, and in that brain mode. So for me to get into the artistic creative zone, I really need to make sure my to-do list is is tackled so that I can just be present and not worry, oh, I didn't do that or I have to do this or I have to tell this person to do to do that person or do this or, you know, having the 7 o'clock, so anytime after 7 p.m. I feel like it's my favorite, favorite music hours. <laughs> what is the maximum length of an effective technique practice session for you? Hmm. I like to warm my voice up for anywhere between 9 and 20 minutes, depending on how much time I have, um, through various different vocal warm-up exercises. I love, I was kind of saying before, using a straw, blowing bubbles, kind of singing songs through the straw. I find that really helpful. Um, I find anything more than an hour and a half is when your voice gets tired and you're not putting in as much um, detail to the vocal performance or even the musicality, you know, playing guitar or piano for that long. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but to get the maximum amount of practice time without exhausting yourself for the next day, I feel like an hour and a half is a good kind of cap if you're going straight. And how do you like to segment your practice time? So you talked about having a nine to 20 minute warm up. What happens after that? Is it going to change when you're preparing to go into the studio versus on the road? What does that look like? Yeah, I would say it's, it's studio world is different than performance world. Um, studio, you want to make sure you're relaxed. So I would add in like stretching and stretching the muscles because when you're tight, which we are often tight because we're, you know, sitting in chairs and I find sometimes I catch myself when I'm sitting like this. I'm like, whoa, I got to sit up tall, girl. Um, so stretching is really important, especially when you have poor posture like that. And that's, I mean, really good for just regular practice as well. But there's just different different little tools. So studio practice, it's all about how do I be the calmest I possibly can? How do I relax my vocal cords the most um, through stretching, through warm-up, um, through steaming, all of, all of those kind of things. I feel like I'm a lot more cautious with the vo voice when I'm in the studio. Um, when I'm practicing, it's a little more free. I don't put as much pressure on the voice to be perfect. I, it's more, or perfect is overrated. That doesn't exist, but to be bang on. So, you know, if my voice is tired, I'll modify through practice however I need to. And it's, it's okay. But if you're in the studio, if your voice is tired, you call the session. Like that's, done and I'm very fortunate we have a recording studio here so I have that flexibility there's another business <laughs> you can start counting <laughs> um so I have that flexibility to be like oh I feel like recording now oh I don't I'm done so I don't have that you know that studio pressure fee that most artists have when they go to pay studio fees it's like you have two hours so make sure you sing your best for those two hours so Taking the pressure off of that really helps. That was a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> well, it brings up a really interesting paradigm around creativity and preparation. Mm -hmm. And the the I don't think there is a right answer, but I just want to pose this sort of for you and also for our listeners. It's thinking about, okay, when you know you only have two hours in a studio and you're constrained by your own budget, there, and this is absolutely not to knock what you're doing because I too have a home setup and like 
love it so much because then I can just record whenever I want to record, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. the, the idea of preparation, I think especially for um, artists who are just starting out and have not had a lot of professional experience, when I'm and Crystal are both talking about having a recording set up in our living space, it's not to negate the work and preparation needed mm -hmm. for the session. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not that we're saying, okay, we have our home setups and that means we're just going to go in and sort of try and get it the first day and sort of try and get it the second day and sort of try and get it the, right. and maybe we're going to get it. It's that you're still preparing as if you're going to the studio, but then you have the luxury if you know, you had an allergic reaction, you ate too much lactose, yes, like whatever it is, that the next day you have the luxury of not needing to perform. And you can say, well, listen, let's try it this afternoon or let's try it tomorrow. But you still need to prepare in the same way, light that fire under yourself the same way you would yes. if you only had two hours in a studio. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we'll still schedule the time, yeah. you know, I'll be like, okay, you know, Wednesday at three to five, we're recording vocals. So that'll still be in the daytime or just like if I were to go to another studio and have a session and I would still prepare the same way and still make sure, you know, I'm warming my voice up properly. I am eating properly because eating what you consume before you sing also has an impact on your voice, which we kind of touched on earlier as well. But, you know, know your food sensitivity. I'm sensitive to everything. So I am a special, a special case, but know what kind of foods hinder your vocal cords and you'll start to kind of, we're all different. So some people can drink coffee before they sing and they're fine. Some people drink coffee before they sing and they are totally dried out. So there's no right or wrong. It's more so what's right or wrong for your body. And I'm really big on tuning into what makes you feel good. And once you know that, then, you know, plan your day for that studio time and, and make sure that you're mentally prepared and going into the studio for those that don't have the luxury of doing the home recording style, making sure you really, this is where meditation comes in. Again, it's like, how can I get myself in this calm, comfortable space in an unfamiliar, you know, high pressure zone. So having the tools to center yourself, to use your breath work, to remain calm in chaos is a very important, very important tool so that you can maximize your performance and you can maximize your time. And then another thing I want to touch on vocally in the studio, you can push your, your voice way too much when you're under pressure. So this is just a, a little tip when you're in the studio performing, making sure that you are singing softly so reminding yourself, I don't need to push. I don't need to push as a coach. I would say that's one of the most common issues that I see amongst singers in the studio is pushing the vocal cords, which tires your voice out in half the time. So think, just use that mantra kind of, I have, I don't need to push. I have a soft, strong voice is, is also very helpful. Let the mic do the work. I Let think, the mic do the work, yeah. I think too, perhaps to touch back on what you said about the stretching. I don't know about anyone else's experience out there. I'll speak for myself. Maybe you can add to this. As soon as I get stressed out or as soon as there's anxiety about something going on, everything up here gets tight. Mm. And as soon as everything up there gets tight, it's impacting tone. It's impacting technique. It's impacting ability to switch between notes. Like try doing a run when you're tight. It's not happening uh-uh mm -mm. so going back to what crystal was saying earlier about that relaxation for the studio and i think really also you, you mentioned this as well doing it for live that being able to get to that place of whew, relaxation loosening everything up having that mind body connection and understanding and knowing what it feels like to be mm -hmm. relaxed to have tension I think is also super duper important. So speaking of holding too much tension, have you ever injured yourself making music? Yes, I have. Um, and I've done it recently. And 
it's when you're tired, when you're stressed, when you think you can do everything and you don't want to say no and you don't want to cancel things and you want to just keep powering through, um, that's when burnout happens and that's when the vocal burnout happens. And just in a recent experience, I went into a recording studio outside of my home and recorded vocals. And that day, I had high stress. I had heartburn. I had tension. I was not relaxed at all. And nothing that I was doing to help relax was happening. And for those of you who haven't experienced heartburn or GERD or anything like that, it directly affects your vocal cords. So because of the acid is coming up and it dehydrates everything and dries everything up. So do not sing in heavy, high performance if you don't have to, <laughs> if you have that situation. But I definitely push myself past my limit just because of those high pressure thoughts of, oh, I have this much time. I have to get this done. I have deadlines. There is no time not to show up for this. So we have to make it happen. Made it happen. But after I had no voice for, I think, 10 days. I couldn't sing so or speak, and that is not okay. So this is just truth. We've all pushed ourselves too far, and I'm a huge believer in not doing that to yourself, but I am also a victim of doing that to myself. So we need to make sure we take care of ourselves because, you know, to sing for two hours in, and then lose your voice for 10 days is not okay. It's not not okay. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And the whole GERD acid reflux thing is insane. Mm -hmm. Cause if it gets really bad, it can actually start to break down your vocal folds. Mm -hmm. You can, you can actually, the acid from your GERD, uh, I'm going to forget what it stands for, but basically the top part of your stomach doesn't close all the way. So it allows some acid to come up into your, uh, esophagus. And then if someone's lying down and they have GERD, that acid can make it all the way into your mouth and it can actually start to break down the vocal folds. Um, so yeah, just uh, if, if anyone has heartburn out there, eh, maybe go talk to a doctor. Um, <laughs> let's talk about creativity. Do you ever take steps yeah. to stay creative? I do. Um, it's easy to lose creativity if you're not constantly in the zone of being creative. I really love the book, The Artist's Way. Um, that's one of my favorite creativity books to kind of reference and go back to. Um, I love, you know, just journaling and kind of writing out ideas that helps me get back into creative. Um, doing things outside of music that are creative help me get back into the musical creative zone as well. So if I'm feeling maybe uninspired or writer, writer's block or anything kind of in that zone, Maybe I'll go paint or draw or do something outside of my typical creative way. Um, I find that helps. Or cleaning. Cleaning helps. Cleaning the physical space helps clean the mental mm. clutter. So I find that helps too. Now, around staying creative, do you ever create boundaries with other humans? Like, do you turn your phone off when you're trying to write a song do you have a certain time of day where people know not to bother you because you're in that creative space? Do you try and set those types of boundaries or not? Um, yeah, I would say putting my phone on silent or turning the phone off in a creative creative zone is very important because, you know, that phone is a very distracting source when you're constantly seeing notifications or can you do this or can you do that or you know, oh, I forgot to do this. And then that can just take you right out of the creative zone. So if you can turn your phone off for, you know, a couple hours and just allow yourself to be present in that creative zone, especially when you're writing, I think that's, I think it's important just to, to keep the magic of that moment alive and, and not let external sources impact that. Do you have a time or times of day where you feel more creative? Usually later at night is when I feel the most creative. Sometimes it hits in the day, but I find nighttime kind of, uh, yeah, after that seven o'clock mark, I feel it's usually when the creativity starts flowing. So have you ever experienced burnout from too much time spent on music specifically? Yes, I have. Um, 
yeah, burnout is a huge issue I find, especially amongst musicians. So if you're recording an album, if you're playing music, if you're promoting music, if you're doing, you know, all the things and not taking the time to sleep properly, especially if you're, you're on the road, if you're playing, you know, I've had stretches where I've played like 18 to 20 shows in eight days and it's a lot on the voice and it's a lot physically and it's a lot mentally to be on all the time is exhausting. And as much as I am a extroverted person that likes to connect with people, I am very much an introvert and I love my own time and my own space and I don't like crowds. I find them very exhausting. I'm a huge empath. So I pick up on a lot of people's emotions. So really making sure I take that time out to just have crystal time or just like in my house time. <laughs> Even if it's just like Darren and I, like I just need that internal reflection time to, to prevent the burnout. And when you don't have space and time for that, then that's definitely when, when burnout occurs. And in your experience, what does burnout feel like? Is it like a disinterest in the subject? Is it a clouding of thought? How, how, what does burnout feel like to you when you get to that point? It's a combination of all of those things and more. Um, yeah, disinterest in just doing anything. Exhaustion, not wanting to talk to anyone or do anything. Um, you know, just eating patterns can change, shift. Sleep patterns can shift and change. Um, mindset outlook on things can change um reaction to you know how you're communicating with people can become more aggressive or just more uncompassionate if you will so when as soon as I start to see any kind of symptoms of those things it's time to retract relax recover there we go just made up a new little retract (laughs) relax recover (laughs) Crystal and her alliterations aplenty. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you experience songwriting, the inspiration of songwriting? Do you, do you experience it as a download, an upwelling? I've always felt like songs come at me like from behind and then they hit me and then they're there. How, do, how does receiving, and again, I'm using th- th- these terminologies, it's so subjective. I'm saying receiving yeah. song and like, let's not even, let's not even unpack receiving yeah. <laughs> a song because like that in and of itself is a whole woo-woo discussion that is like listen we, we could get it like totally insane so but how does the inspiration totally. feel for you well it's kind of like what i mentioned before like a vessel of inspiration it's just okay. i feel like um the songs just sometimes just come out and you're like i have no idea where this thought came from where this song came from where this story came from but here it is <laughs> so let's roll with it and <laughs> let's not try to figure it out and just feel it <laughs> mm, feeling 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 so yeah do you have you noticed any patterns with your songwriting in terms of what part of the song comes first or if the whole song comes like is it the lyrics first is it the story first are you hearing a lick are you hearing a riff are you hearing a musical idea it's different every time I find, especially lately. It's sometimes it's the hook that's in my head. Sometimes it's just a melody line mm. that's in my head. Um, sometimes it's something I'm playing on the guitar. Then I'm like, oh, this is cool. And it comes resurfaces in a few months. And um, sometimes it's a an experience that I had that, you know, we write about. Or sometimes it's an experience that I've witnessed somebody else have or something, a feeling I saw on TV can be even a thing, right? It's just the observation of life is, is typically my inspiration, but the way the song comes out, it's, it's different all the time. Hmm. Yeah. Do you prefer to write after listening to music or do you prefer a clean slate where you haven't listened to music for a day or several hours? I, I like to listen to music, um, to be inspired. I usually find having a reference track of of a song that I'm like, Oh, I want to write a song that kind of like feels like Uh, this. Sometimes that's really helpful to go back and forth between. Um, but some, one of my pet peeves that I do not like is when it's like, Oh, this song, what you just said sounds like this other song. I feel like that takes me out of the, the moment of the creation because now it's become a 
comparison and how to do something not like that as opposed to just allowing things to to flow so in that perspective I don't like that but if I want something to inspire me to create something with that same kind of feel then I do like listening to to a reference track has performance anxiety ever threatened to impact or impacted your performance? Yes, lots. Um, performance anxiety is a real thing <laughs> that, you know, we can have all the tools, but if we don't have the, you can have all the tools, but if you don't have the mindset to apply the tools, then the tools are useless, if that makes sense. And I've definitely had lots of times in the past where I didn't have the understanding on how to use the tools in the toolbox. Um, but there is a moment I really, really remember. It was at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. And I remember standing in the backstage zone and I was so nervous and I was playing, you know, for a full theater with just me and my guitar. And I just felt like I couldn't function. Like I was like, oh, I, I can't even play. Like my body is shaking. I'm red. I'm like hyperventilating, all of these things. And something just came over me where I was like, no, Crystal, you have a choice right now to either keep the switch off like you are in this mindset or you turn the, turn the switch on and you shift that nerve to excitement and you shift mm. that mindset. You're going to feel exactly the same. You're still going to be, you know, when you're excited, you're, you kind of shake and you smile and you're, you're, you can turn red or flustered or your, your heat levels can change. When you're nervous, the same physical feelings can happen. So all this changing is your mindset. And when I did that, it was just like, oh, why am I doing this? Because I love doing this. I love performing. I love being on stage. And that was just a huge moment in my, in my career, in my life that not even just for music, but just for life in general, you can choose how you want to react to a situation. And maybe it's not always as easy as flipping a switch, but if you have that mentality of, oh, I'm just turning the switch on, it's a lot easier to kind of snap into character okay this is my stage character an elevated version of me I'm going to go out there and be excited about it and not be afraid of it so that would be some advice I have just for people in general is you know get excited about what you're doing if you love what you're doing turn those nerves into excitement I think what you're saying is super interesting because like you're saying the biochemical reaction of stress is going mm -hmm. to happen it, that unless you're a psychopath or you have like you know Alex Honnold the guy who does like free solo climbing like I think he was talking about there's something in his brain where he just does not experience as much fear as everyone else so anyway if you're Alex Honnold or a psychopath you know you you you, you might not feel this but for everyone else there's this natural biochemical reaction to stress you have this fight or flight reaction and deciding how it's like you're riding a horse it's like which direction are you going to ride mm -hmm. that adrenaline which which direction are you going to take that and that perspective is huge and so what you're talking about is this incredible moment where instead of approaching a situation with fear you're you're approaching it with love excitement mm -hmm. gratitude and making that shift internally of how you're positioning your perception of the experience makes all the difference in the world. And it's a it's really incredible story. Yeah, it makes such a big difference. And, you know, once I started applying that mindset to things, it made it so much easier and more fun and enjoyable. Mm. And, and we're here to have fun. We're here to enjoy the process. So, you know, I'm not diminishing stage anxiety because it's a real... It's a real thing. And if we just have different ways that we can move through it, it, it makes a huge difference. So flip the switch. Flip, flip it, folks. Crystal, <laughs> those are all my questions for you. you have anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to touch on, or shall we call it a day? You know what? I think we covered a lot of ground there. So thank you so much for, for connecting and, and having me on your show. Oh, absolutely. Crystal McGrath, her latest pop country single, About a Boy, is out now wherever you get your music. You can find Crystal on Instagram and Twitter, at Crystal McGrath, and on Facebook, at Crystal McGrath Music. And there is a box of jelly beans behind me. Each one has a name of a company that Crystal runs on it. And to the listener, who can guess by the sound of these jelly beans... <laughs> How many businesses Crystal McGrath runs, you will be the winner 
of a virtual t-shirt. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. Crystal, thanks so much for coming on the show. See you folks next time. Thank you.